This is Critical Nonsense, our high lowbrow show about culture, science, and tech. This week, Aaron asks us about finding financial security. Werewolf bar mitzvah, spooky, scary, boys becoming men, men, men becoming, becoming wolves. wolves. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> that was good. And this is what a Joey sounds like. Down, down, down the road, down the witch's road. This is what an Agatha Harkness and Aaron <laughs> sounds like, along with Joe Locke as a character in that show that you should watch. And I'm not going to say anymore to spoil anything. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And this is what an executive producer and Ghostbuster Jess Vander sounds like. Hi, this is Jess. Um, nice. I have housekeeping. I am screaming it. May I? May I housekeep? Um. Oh, please do. Yes. Okay. So, Tuesday, this upcoming Tuesday, 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 is the election (laughs) in the United States of America. It's a big one. Um, And so, I just want to throw out there, uh, please vote. Um, Make a plan if you have not voted yet in where you are uh, living. If you are not registered, you can still register to vote. Go to vote.org to find out how. You can vote by mail, and you'll, it's still valid 15 days postmarked, so please be on top of it. Uh, and also, I would say, um, you know, a lot of folks are skeptical, um, and a lot of folks are probably sitting around being like, I don't know if I should vote, um, and are thinking it is what it is, the system is broken, the system is not going to change or anything like that. Um, and to that, my only thought is, Make sure that your skepticism is your companion and not your captor. Go ahead, get to that poll, drop it in. If nothing happens, say la vie. But if something does happen and you weren't a part of it, um, you become captive to this one moment and this one decision. So it doesn't take that much. Go do it. Give it a whirl. It ain't gonna hurt nobody. It actually is more likely going to help you and your fellow man. So go for it. Woo. Also, I, I think you just outlined was, Pasc- Pascal's ballot. <laughs> uh, I don't know what that means, Joey. Please tell us more. Pascal's wager, like the idea of like God could exist or couldn't exist, but if he does exist, it's better to believe in him than not <laughs> so that you can go to heaven or wherever. You have just taught many, many hopefully newly registered voters who did this in the past five seconds, what they need to do. I agree. (laughs) I think that's great. (laughs) And if for whatever reason, because it wasn't scheduled to go live on this coming Monday, if this gets posted afterward, I hope you voted. Hope you got to them polls. And if not, then whoops. No. Okay, cool. (laughs) Pokemon went, went, went (laughs) to the polls. Um... Y'all, I yes, yes. Okay, I have uh, I have uh, may, is is there any other uh, keeping of house to do? Is that house kept? None. Yay! None. This house is clean. House is clean. Um, then friends, Romans countrymen, lend me your ears. I have a query for you. Uh, that comes by way not just of my cold, which all listeners no doubt have heard by now, uh, but honestly something that's been on my mind quite a bit lately, uh, and perhaps it is because of a lot of the chatter about the election, but it's been about the, the economy. Really, really small things. Um, and before we started recording, uh, some of what came up is the sort of really practical side of the economy that comes up on a daily basis for everyday people like me, Joey, and Jess, just like saving money and spending money and thinking about that when you're doing it and or avoiding thinking about doing it when you're not doing it. Um, And, you know, I'm going to skip a little bit of a really erudite preamble, partially because it's Friday when we're recording this and my brain is fried by NyQuil and a lot of Mucinex. And so I'm just going to go to the question that I have, which is, 
what's the best way to unlock a sense of financial security in all of us? <laughs> Talk about it like we're doing on this podcast. Yes. Ah, wait, Jess, please tell us more about that. I don't know. You know, just it's like a funny thing how how uncomfy people can get, even with their closest people. Like, I can understand mm -hmm. why it might be socially uncomfortable to talk about it, perhaps. But with people who are close to you or even with people at, you know, like your manager at work, like there are some things that are surprisingly challenging when actually um, it's a really great way to get more comfortable. You can just talk more um, because then uh, your mind goes less crazy and starting to all that uncertainty or black box can get a little bit clearer. Hmm. But I, yeah, I, it's more like why or why we get so spooked. Mm. I think, you know, it's one of those things where, um, you know, being able to get to a point where you feel financial security, like also implies that you have a sense of satisfaction in like a lot of other parts of your life i i think right like that you are content and there there's some of that is like well what those questions of like well what do i want where do i want to be like there's like a lot of existential questions embedded like just beneath the surface of financial security where you have to be like actually i like what what is important to me what are the things, like, how do I want to live my life? Where do I want to be in X number of year, 5, 10, 20? What, what do I want my retirement to look like? Like, it requires you to answer a lot of questions about how you feel and what you want for your life to get to a point where then you would also feel financially secure. And I think there are a lot of people who, you know, they're outside of the realm of people who are facing serious financial insecurity there are people who maybe would otherwise be considered financially secure that don't feel it because those questions are hard. I don't have answers to those questions if I'm being 100% honest, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yep. I mean, it's it's so interesting to me, too, because you, like, highlight... You both just highlighted two things. One is this, like, contentment. Like, if you're content, then you can have the freedom to start thinking about, like, what is the plan later on? Um, and like, what's your, and, but, and that brings up the spooky yukis that are both like individually and culturally sort of reinforced, like, and even literally, even in this moment, I ha like, I have to say this, it's jumping out of my soul is like, I am going to be a little bit more vulnerable in this conversation. I am aware that I am biased. I am going to probably step in some poo and like like my my preconceptions are going to like be revealed, you know, like and I hope that the audience gives me grace as I and we have this conversation. And it's almost like a reflex that I feel to say that because I'm aware of those spooky ukies that exist in American culture and in other cultures around money, like talking about money as a taboo. And then mm -hmm. also I recognize that like. I am in a place of financial security, which almost allows me to only focus on like the top part. If it, I don't know if there's like a Maslow's hierarchy of need for financial security only, like financial needs like in a, in a in isolation. But a lot of what's going on in my mind is about the top of that, as opposed to thinking about like food and shelter and all those things that money is necessary to help unlock, like mm -hmm. and. I don't know. I, I, I almost, again, like, I almost feel like I have to say that because I'm aware of, like, I'm aware of how different it is and how many people are also trapped in that middle zone of, like, not in crisis mode, but also not in secure mode. Mm -hmm. No, it's such a great point. Like, the, uh, like, the balance of, there's, like, two completely separate things of, how much money you have or are able to make and 
the, the, how much you are confronting it, right? Like you can be making a lot and still <laughs> confronting it, not at all, or trying mm -hmm. to avoid conversations around it or, um, and that that's easier, I suppose, if you are making sufficient money that you don't have to, um, mm -hmm. versus when you are forced to confront it. Um, but yeah, you're, it's really interesting to think about that middle space where there's more, um, sort of fluctuation or, or maybe there's more potential if you do confront it to have that be end that advantageous to you in, in the future. Right. Um, so where, where sort of those two separate things start colliding between what you make and how much you think about it. And if you can actually, by thinking about it or talking about it, help then solidify your financial stability. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Yeah. Can I, can I ask a question? I like didn't occur to me until you were talking about this, but I think there is, um, there is a tendency when the, like to be, to become like over fixated on it. Right. It, because of like, especially even when we embed it with like an idea, like financial security, that's like a way that a lot of us, you know, in culture and experts and, you know, you brought up Susie Orman in the pre-show, like that idea of like establishing a sense of financial security, protecting yourself for the future. But there in that, I, I like had never had this thought, but of being so fixated on yourself and establishing yourself that then it can like, does that over fixation on financial security create a sense of, I don't want to say greed because I think that's uh, like too far, but I don't have like the lesser version of that thing, like a little bit too, like, does it wind up creating a situation where you're like taking and hoarding as an aspect of doing that, that could be in other ways, like deleterious to your life or relationships or whatever, or even just like your day-to-day -day lived experience, right? Like you hear about these people that like, the that fire movement world i've seen it several posts from like come out of the reddit fire movement world where they're like i like did all these things to like save up money and like retire early i, I delayed having kids i did all these things and they're like i just got it so wrong like they were in the position that they wanted to get to they made it and they were like i waited too long to have kids i would give up all of that what i have to have like have more years in my life where I could experience my relationship with my kids or like their grandkids or things like that. Or like I, you know, wasted my late twenties and early thirties, like hoarding for this goal instead of like living my life. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I mean, one of the things that is always challenging is that money is not what anybody is ever talking about when they talk about money, like, and when they think about money, it's like people are really thinking about totally. control. They're thinking about motivation. They're thinking about values. They're thinking about freedom and their goals. And it's like status, status, like, and I think the consistent trap, like a lot of those, well, like the fire, the specific fire folks that you're talking about within the fire movement is thinking that like the goal like almost setting the goal aside from the motivation. And I think that that's where, when those different things are misaligned, that's when you can end up with like weird and un unfortunate outcomes or, or surprising outcomes, right? Like, because I was even thinking about the way, Jess, that you were sort of talking about like, you know, the amount of money you have and the amount of um, like perspective or, or awareness you have of it. And, you know, to put on my Susie Old Orman shoulder pads, the other element to that is also, like, what you spend and, like, how much you're spending. And so, like, and when you start to put all those things into a blender, it actually is all about, like, trying to um, give people a sense of control when otherwise it feels like we have none. Because the money is bestowed upon us by employ, like old ways of thinking, but like money is bestowed upon us by employer, and then hopefully we can live our lives. You you know what this makes me think of is that 
um, that idea that you had brought on a previous episode, Joey, about diagnosing <laughs> problems and solving them. Like, hey, if you're feeling like you're cranky, eat something, you know, <laughs> like, is there an equivalent yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, solution system for your money, <laughs> your, your sort of uh, <laughs> money <laughs> constructs or money needs, right? Like if, if your, if your money habits revolve around fear, then talk about it. Or if your money mm -hmm. habits revolve around status, then, um, Oh goodness, I don't know the answers to these questions, but you get the picture, right? Is there is there, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Is there an, a simpler solution like that? I also, I mean, within this, I love the idea of just like recentering the problem not on the money, but on like yourself or like what your mm -hmm. orientations are because then I think it gets you a little bit closer to like what's your what's motivating you and what's going to make you feel better? Like what's going to give you a sense of peace? Cause I feel like at the end of the day, like yeah. what financial security really manifests in, at least when we, like I've, we've done a lot of research and I spend a lot of time in financial conversations, like with, with a lot of work projects, but like a lot of times when we talk to people about what financial security literally means, it means not thinking about money. Like to get to the point where the out the mm -hmm. inflow and the outflow becomes un it it becomes secondary or not even something you have to think about because then you are able to just make decisions and be free to make whatever decisions feel best for you. And to get to that place of the inflow and outflow shifting, most people think it means, especially Americans, add more, <laughs> like get more stuff. Yeah. And in many and Again, like we talked about that donut zone in the middle, depending on how like there like the poverty line is real, like working poverty, shadow poverty, those are all real things. And so like I, I don't want to dismiss those at all. Um, but there is, you know, at some point it is like, when are you able to start doing the mental and emotional work to let go of the fixation? And the negative outcomes mm -hmm. and consequences yeah. that can come from that fixation. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think that point you made, Aaron, of like, what is, what's the thing underneath? Like, what's the emotional thing that you need is like so well taken, right? Like, even someone who is fixated on financial security is is like, it probably is like rooting from like a control thing of like pre predicting, you. you that you mm -hmm. can't predict what will happen. So like making sure you're in a situation where in any negative circumstance, you would be in a, like, you know, not um, entirely screwed or have, have some mm -hmm. air cover or whatever. But I think e even more to your point, right? Like the, the extreme poverty orientation of the conversation of, right. Of like living, like there were points growing up where I had like food insecurity that just sticks with you. Like it, like yeah. it's really hard to get yeah. rid of, but the, we are moving increasingly towards, you know, whether it will ever happen. Like I, I don't mean this as a prediction of what the future will definitively look like, but we are moving towards a post scarcity world, right? Like, Poverty, global poverty is continuously on the decline. U.S. poverty is continuously on the decline. Food scarcity is on the decline. And I think about that through the lens of what you said from like, how do we contend with like, when you're dealing with like multi-generational orientations towards money and scarcity and those types of ideas, like habits that are really hard to break and will carry over you know, from my parents into my children, uh, like in a post scarcity world, what does that look like? What do you do with your time? How do you orient your relationship to things and stuff and money and experiences? Um, you know, whether we will be alive in some like utopian world, unlikely, but we will increasingly move towards, you know, that type of 
world, hopefully. You know, I guess we, you already did the election disclaimer, so I won't <laughs> go into that. But but it, it it's like it, it even when your life is getting better, you have that hedonic treadmill of like, well, I was worried about this before. Am I just like transplanting my worry, whether it's about money or something into a new level? Like the the boogeyman is gone, but the the worry is still there. So I will like fixate it on something else. I mean, there are two things that you just mentioned that I get really excited by and that make my brain grapes turn into a nice Pinot Noir. <laughs> Squeeze. One of them uh, is, I mean, I do think that there is a tension between scarcity and distribution. So even if we have, even if we get to mm-hmm. a point, we're, we experience this in the US right now, even though there is an abundance of stuff, like there's enough wealth so that no person needs to have, no person globally needs to be in poverty right now. Like literally in this moment, we know that that is like economically proven out. If you just did it mathematically and you just divided like the number of yeah. people globally by the amount of wealth in the world, but it always comes down to distribution. And so while we might have much less scarcity, there will still be unequal distribution, which will still allow yep. a scarcity of mindsets to proliferate in many different places and to be real. Um, but the other thing is the notion of uh, like intergenerational, uh, I mean, it's, it's intergenerational trauma. It absolutely is a form of intergenerational trauma. And, you know, I even hearing you think about that and reflect on that when you think about how you experience it as a parent and thinking about it with your child, like me as a child, I know that I have a lot, like the majority of my dad's projects mindset when it comes to finances. Um, and it is very difficult to break that. And, I, you know, I'm like, I'm I'm very open to the fact or very like aware that both he and I are not in the position that he was when he was an, when he when he was a child but also i've inherited those things to a degree that now manifests as i wouldn't say a hyper frugality but uh you know like a 10% mattress under the money under the mattress like the other shoes going to drop you need to be prepared like that sort of thing um and it's less in so the in second ex- standard deviation <laughs> <laughs> right, right, exactly, exactly. Um, and so ultimately, like, I, I, you know, and I think that you might actually have more to share, like, to more perspective on this than we would. But, um, you know, when I think about all the things that we inherit from parents that they don't know that they gave us, it's like when our parents said that one thing that one time that they don't remember saying, like, it sticks and <laughs> yes. all of a sudden it becomes the backbone of your entire identity and you're like, oh God, that's the one you held on to? None of the other stuff. <laughs> None of the yeah. other ones that I spent all this time programming and you held on to that one moment when I was really tired and I still needed my coffee. Um, but then there are others that I think are more pernicious and more like, you know, in the ether, like... um we don't know if we will always have, so you must always be prepared in case you have nothing. Like that, when that, that, that to your point, just like with food insecurity, mm-hmm. that is a survi- that becomes fused with survival. And therefore, it is not something that's mm-hmm. easy or logical to turn off. Like to just be like, oh no, you don't have to worry mm-hmm. about that. Um, yeah, I mean, you brought up, you brought up like Maslow's hierarchy of needs and, and, the fact that like you are you are potentially in this place where you could be focusing on that sort of like enlightenment level of needs but these types of ideas inherently like draw you back down to survival when the reality is like you always have to have some like base level of like check oh yep i'm not in danger of not surviving and then you can sort of like go back up but when it's pulling your your energy and your focus and your attention and your concern back down to like base level needs, even when it's not required. Like let's talk specifically about like our situation, like that is not required. And yet we, Mm -hmm. we can pull ourselves back into that out of, you know, the specter of the unknown. And obviously Mm -hmm. the specter of the unknown is always, it's there like 
walking down the street, you know, like you could get hit by a car or, or something like that. But we don't, you know, at least I will speak for myself. I don't walk down the street with like some undue concern that, you know, someone's going to drive over the sidewalk and, and hit me. Like it could happen, but I understand the probabilistic reality of, you know, how likely is that to happen? And so I carry on and think about other things, but somehow in money, because you're, you're sort of like pushed into a future orientation. Will I have enough for groceries next week? Or will I have enough for rent or, or will I have enough to, you know, see my parents later this year? Like though that future orientation inherently brings you into this like ambiguous unknown space where you're being forced to make predictions. And some of them are like, well, if I keep my job, I do a good job. I will get paid this many times between now and then. And that, that will happen. And yet you being in that unknown space, like pulls us into, you know, that potential for creating boogeymen, particularly when you had experiences in your past that, you know, the boogeyman showed up, right? Yes. Yes. I, I, you know, I, I know that we are probably very close to, um, run DMC's corner. Uh, and so I wanted to hit, that's the wrap up corner. That was really bad. That was a really bad one. You got it. <laughs> You're great. You know, just for the new listeners, I wanted to make sure that they caught that joke. Um, <laughs> you surfaced two things that I, I couldn't let go by. One of them that I think is really, that has been really revelatory to me is understanding the relationship between mental health and financial insecurity and how at times one can influence the other in really dramatic ways. So I spend a lot of yep. time thinking about like, oh, like, you know, there's a lot of history of undiagnosed anxiety and depression in my family. That is sitting alongside a lot of my financial insecurity experiences. And so recognizing that there are like factors that might be more in my control that previous generations didn't have to be able to manage my relationship with that, that have nothing to do with my budgeting or spending or awareness was really relieving to me. So again, back to that question of like, how can we unlock that sense? Sometimes it can be medicinal. <laughs> Sometimes it can be through therapy. Um, but then the other thing too, which is probably a bigger, you know, bucket that we'll maybe save for another time, uh, is the idea of visibility. And I think this is really interesting because there are some people who gain a greater sense of peace from seeing more and paying more attention to their inflow, outflow, money situation, and others find more peace by ignoring it altogether. Um, and weirdly, even in both of those cases, you can have people saying like, oh, money's not on my mind. <laughs> like they still are, when they're in a place of financial security, you can be on both ends of that extremes and feel good about it. Um, but I do find that that's like very, very interesting to figure out like, or very, very interesting to pay attention to the fact that both of those are levers that can be pulled to weirdly get to the same end point for different types of people. But I guess... I did I mean, kind of. Couldn't I couldn't say it better. I yeah, I was about to say I guess that like That is a wrap up corner, I think. I, can we just go ahead and claim that that's the wrap up corner and just give ourselves that out? Yeah. Cuz I think that that's was it. was beautiful. That was it. <laughs> um yay clap, and clap, clap. um yeah, yeah. Everybody talk to the people in your life about money cuz it'll take away the stigma and everybody will be a little bit more relieved. Thanks. That's what we got today. Critical Nonsense is a Sylvain production. Brought to you by the Illuminati, because we made sure that that pyramid on the back of the $1 bill has the creepy eye with the, like, pyramid and the, and the rays of light thing. It was a cool idea. We were a little bit drunk at the lounge. We just decided to do it. So get your dollar bills where you can find them. Pew, pew, pew. <laughs> As always, we'd like to thank our executive producer and certified financial planner, not actually, this is not financial advice, Jess Vander. We would also like to thank sound engineer and the Scrooge to my McDuck, Alex Contell. We'd like to thank penny-pinching aficionado and programming coordinator, Les Jacobs. 
and we must thank the just the 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 the, the financial plumage behind Nora Mestrich and Sara Gilbert for making this production jazzy. <laughs> As always, thanks, Alan. Wait, there are more people that we have to thank. Wait, 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 wait. wait. We also have to thank KJ and Amy Waters. Let's go. Yeah, them too. Them too. Them too. Yeah, they're in there too. Yes, okay. Them. Yeah. Yeah. And them. yes. And then thanks, Alan. And then thanks. special no thanks to the internet because <laughs> Amen. it's really being annoying right now. Yo, <laughs> they, service oh. providers. What's up? Well, stop. I, can we? This is on. This is on two different levels. So understood that Joey's got internet issues right in this moment that we're recording. But I was also say that like the most cesspooliness of the internet has been just like out to get us in this lead up to the election. And like, I I just need a break. I need a nap. I need to wake <laughs> up in like the great times. That's all I know. And I don't want to hear anybody else's think piece, thought piece, opinion on anything. That's really ironic considering what we're recording right now. But, you know, ignore ignore that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, we did it. Thank did you. It. No, thank you. <laughs> thank you. No, thank you. Please go vote. Make a plan. Go do it. Vote.org. Yes. All righty. Love you. Mean it. Bye. All right, ready? Yes. Oh, God, I'm going to be a bad Jess. Critical okay. nonsense. <laughs> okay, are you ready? Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, my this stupid internet is so annoying. Um, all right, ready? Um, Critical nonsense is a Sylvain production.